Among the crowd that gathered that day to honor the memory of the esteemed Bishop Carlton Pearson was the Reverend Pastor Shirley Caesar. Pastor Caesar was attentively listening to a fellow clergyman deliver his speech when the unimaginable happened. During his address, the unknown clergyman made references to his spouse, but when the camera panned in that direction, to the dismay of the entire gathering, the bishop's spouse was, in fact, a man. As a leader, as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a pastor. He took both me and First G, my beautiful husband right there. Brethren, no matter how attentive we are to God, there comes a time when just one weakness in us can be the difference between heaven and hell. That's why we are here today, to find out how this self-conscious clergyman, with all his good deeds, ended up not just in a same-sex relationship, but also as a queer bishop. Did God approve of his calling to the office of the bishop, even as gay? And how is he reconciling his spiritual consciousness with his present action? Let's find out. Apart from being visibly disturbing and bizarre, the revelation shows that something is grossly wrong in society. What Bishop Pearson represented and the community he championed throughout his life are common knowledge. And frankly, not everyone in that auditorium that day was surprised at it. But it was later that I discovered that the clergyman who was reading his tribute to the late Carlton Pearson was Oliver Clyde Allen. Allen also bears the title of bishop and is a proud member of the LGBTQ community, united in matrimony with a man. In fact, his consecration to the bishopric was officiated by none other than Bishop Carlton Pearson himself. Not even here as a bishop, though he consecrated me to the office of bishop. Before I delve into talking about Bishop Clyde Allen and the controversies of his homosexual marriage to another man, let me quickly remind you of who the late Pearson was and what he represented. Growing under the influence of Oral Roberts, who once saw in him a potential heir, Carlton Pearson became a powerful preacher in the late 80s, exerting a profound influence on his contemporaries often celebrated as one of the most consequential preachers of the 20th century. Pearson superintended the Higher Dimensions Family Church in Tulsa to remarkable heights, drawing over 6,000 congregants weekly in the 1990s. His Azusa conferences, a soul-soaking fusion of music and ministry, drew multitudes to Oral Roberts University. It was the atmosphere in these gatherings that became instrumental to the rise of eminent preachers like T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, and the late Dr. Miles Monroe. In those days, Dr. Monroe, a confidant of Pearson, was a regular at these conferences, often sharing prophecies and prayers. Had Pearson maintained his sound message, he might have been seen as the natural successor to Billy Graham, given his stature as a pivotal ministerial figure in America and his role as a faith advisor to Presidents Bush and Clinton. Yet, in the twilight of the 90s, Pearson's path took an unexpected turn. He introduced a radical shift in his theological views, often succumbing to heresies and teaching the congregation about the non-existence of hell and other heretical messages. This move redirected the flow of his ministry for the rest of his life. Bishop Carlton Pearson's message of inclusion significantly impacted various preachers, especially within black Pentecostal circles. His influence was evident in the rise of several prominent figures in the religious community. As earlier mentioned, preachers like T.D. Jakes, Miles Monroe, Joyce Meyer, Juanita Bynum, and Donnie McClurkin gained national notoriety, in part due to the platform provided by Pearson. Stop telling people they're going to hell. I said, I don't care if they're sitting there with a needle in their arm, drunk, smoking a joint, HIV positive. Tell them their sins are forgiven. There's no issue between them and God that hasn't been resolved in Jesus. Then I started thinking about the absurdity and the vulgarity of eternal torture. If it was purgative or corrective or remedial, I could understand some kind of hell. But when it's punishment and little children, if you're 12 and over, <laughs> till you're 90 years old would all go and be tormented. It just didn't, I couldn't reconcile that with the moral character of a God of love. But before you think members of Pearson's congregation were okay with this type of gospel, just no, they weren't. 
In fact, the shift in Carlton Pearson's theological message was met with significant resistance from his congregation and ecclesiastical authorities. In a swift turn of events, he found himself stripped of his accolades and labeled a heretic. The backlash was so immediate and tragic that fellow preachers publicly condemned his new teachings. Once held in high esteem, Pearson experienced a steep fall from grace, losing everything he had built through sound and biblical doctrine. It was indeed an unfortunate time to be alive. But while everyone lay in the comfort of their homes, thinking that was the end of it, they didn't catch the air of what was coming into the church. Little did they know that a strange teaching, like a behemoth from the pits of hell, was slowly creeping into the body of Christ. Yes, because what happened next brought about the problematic rise of homosexual teachings we have in American churches today. Apart from the heretical teachings that Carlson Pearson was known for, his decline from the truth also marked the dawn of his doctrine of inclusion. Brethren, this was the crop of teachings that inspired queer-minded individuals and pastors, such as Oliver Clyde Allen. What this inclusive gospel or doctrine simply posits is that the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ grant universal salvation, negating the need for true repentance. The doctrine also contends that salvation is granted unconditionally, asserting that faith in Jesus is not a prerequisite, nor is it necessary to forgive sins. Before I move on to dissect this erroneous teaching through the lenses of the Bible and the havoc it has caused in the church, let's also focus a little on the person of Bishop Oliver Clyde Allen. Bishop Oliver Clyde Allen III and his spouse, Rashad Burgess, have advocated for inclusivity within religious spaces, particularly for the LGBT. BTQ plus community. Their relationship and work have been a source of inspiration for many rainbow individuals, as well as a source of uneasiness for the church. For instance, Bishop Allen's stance on LGBTQ plus inclusivity within the church has brought about several discussions and debates. He founded the Vision Cathedral of Atlanta with his husband in 2005, a predominantly black Pentecostal church with a significant LGBTQ plus congregation. His approach to ministry is based on the belief that that churches that oppress LGBTQ plus individuals are not true churches and hence fall short of the accepting nature of Christ. But what people like this fail to realize is that even though Christ was very accepting of sinners and inclusive of all, he never tolerated sin nor compromised his essence. This means that Bishop Allen's view is a total departure from Orthodox and Christian teachings. He doesn't just teach about the positivity of homosexuality, he also practices it, which is ironic because many Orthodox Christian preachers today don't practice what they preach. This is something that God seriously frowns upon, just like he frowns upon upon those who engage in same-sex marriages. Look at what God's Word says in the book of Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. This verse emphasizes that intimate relations between men should not mirror those between men and women. It speaks of God's design for sexual relationships within the bounds of heterosexual marriage. Similarly, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 says, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination they shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. This passage is part of the Holiness Code in Leviticus. It reflects the ancient Israelite perspective on sexual morality. The severity of the punishment underscores the gravity of violating this divinely instituted order. Bishop Allen and Rashad Burgess have been together for over two decades, and they recently celebrated their 20th anniversary by renewing their vows in an extravagant ceremony attended by family, friends, and their children. Yes, you heard that right. Their children and their union even predate the legalization of same-sex marriage in America. Bishop Allen and Burgess's relationship could be seen beyond personal, but also professional, as they have worked together to create a space where people of color and members of the LGBTQ community find solace and acceptance. I don't know how anyone else sees this type of union, but from all indications, it's heading for the ditch. First, the teaching they advocate is that of universal salvation. The the idea that all souls will ultimately ascend to heaven, regardless of their beliefs or actions, whether they truly repent of their sins or not. This perspective suggests that one's life choices or faith convictions are irrelevant to their eternal destiny. This notion stands in stark contrast to what we see in the Bible. The essence of God is fundamentally rooted in love. It's not merely that God has love for us 
but rather he embodies love itself. This foundational understanding of divine love is crucial to understanding that our repentance and faith in Jesus is just a tiny part of what we must do to be saved. But people like Bishop Clyde Allen and his spouse are distorting the concept of love, exploiting it to justify living in ways deemed sinful. Thus, they misuse God's loving nature as a pretext for wrongdoing. Such actions are a mockery of grace, trivializing the profound significance of God's love for us. Secondly, the Holy Scripture clearly states, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. This statement, often used in discussions of morality and proper human conduct, categorizes actions as acceptable and those as abominable. Our deeds, our speech, and our appearance are all significant, and we should be careful about them. Indeed, God does not yield to compromise, and to align with this principle, we must stand apart from worldly ways. The divine commandment is to distinguish ourselves and embrace the uniqueness of our creation. The apostles exemplified this separateness, which is why they faced such fierce opposition from the authorities and the populace of their era. Their adherence to the gospel set them apart, establishing a standard that diverged from the norm. The scriptures recount a time when the early Christians, led by the apostles, were so transformative in their teachings that they were accused of turning the world on its head. For instance, the Apostle Paul ventured into Asia. This region revered the goddess Diana and confronted the local craftsmen like Demetrius and the silversmiths who profited from the worship of idols. Paul boldly proclaimed that the deities fashioned by human hands were not divine. I know it's tough to go the right way, especially in this age where it seems the very system of the world is fashioned against holiness. But we must draw inspiration from the scriptures each day and not let the world dictate to us how we live. Please leave any questions, thoughts, or contributions in the comment section below. Also, please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and family. God bless.